slight modification of a more security related talk. And it's personally an issue I have very strong feelings about, especially that mobile device usage is becoming uh, a dominant way in which we interact with both the internet and various digital devices. And so in this talk, I want to start out by describing what I mean when I say mobile device. I'm going to explain the definition of what an open platform is, or what I define an open, open platform is. I have found it, it is at least now uh, one of two-ish definitions that might be out there. I'll also explain why we really should care about open mobile platforms, why it really matters, as well as if there are any currently out there right now. And finally, I'll try and provide some information about what the future holds when we're discussing open mobile platforms and if we're currently seeing uh, an increase or a, sh a slow movement towards open platforms or not. So to start out, I'll talk about um, mobile devices and, and in this case it's, it's pretty clear we've got smartphones. I'm sure most people in the room uh, have a smartphone. They're now about 50%-ish of the U.S. market share of cell phones. Tablets, which are now becoming more popular as the iPad came out, and then the slew of Android tablets and things like uh, HP's failed tablet and the Palm tablets, which didn't necessarily go anywhere. And e-readers, which now with the release of the Kindle Fire and the Nook tablet have expanded into this cross between the traditional Kindle e-reader and a more modern iPad. So <clears throat> then, well, why, why, why should we really care if these devices we own are open? I mean, I pop open my Kindle Fire, it works, I can download books, I can read things. Do I really need to modify the software on it? Do I really care if I can root my device and, and gain complete access over it? The same with my smartphone. I just want to open it up and make calls, right? Well, that is probably a, a, the major arguments that I've heard made against having open platforms and against people giving people privileges to modify their devices. But I think there's really three major reasons why we should care about this. The first being, well, there's the general notion of an open philosophy, which I'll talk about. And that stems from a lot of the thoughts that come from the Free Software Foundation as well as the Electronic Frontier Foundation, so ideas of an open internet and open source software. We also have to think about individuals with disabilities. I mean, these are peop people that companies generally do not cater for unless they're forced to. And that's mainly because they're Sadly, they're, they're not the customer base that makes up the majority of the customers. So many companies feel, well, they don't need to cater to them because if they don't, they're not going to lose that much money. And finally, the hackers, tinkers, and makers out there who like to do these very creative and innovative things with their devices, and they need this sort of access. So to talk about an open philosophy, I think the basic principle is, and, and this stems from much of the fight that went on long ago with DRM and really still goes on, is if I own a device, I should be able to modify it however I want because it's my device. I bought it. It's my equipment. It's not your device. Why should Sony or uh, Sony Ericsson or Motorola or Samsung tell me what to do with my smartphone? If I break it, then I break it. But let me modify it how I please. And in fact, I, I didn't actually realize that Free Software Foundation had this when I created my criteria for an open platform, but the Free Software Foundation actually has a hardware endorsement criteria. So if your hardware matches all of these criteria, you can put a nice little Free Software Foundation badge on it. And, and they mirror a lot of my notions of what an open platform should entail. And then, again, persons with the disabilities. Well, adaptations to the devices go beyond just providing accessibility applications. 
not everybody can just get by with the magnifying glass or the on-screen keyboard or these basic pieces of software that we know as accessibility applications. And some of them can require fundamental OS access. So if I need to add teletype functionality to my cell phone because I'm a deaf individual and I want to be able to type and have it sent over the cell lines and receive information back, I can't necessarily do that via the software keyboard because the interaction between the audio portions of the phone and the software portions of the phone don't connect. Or in fact, if you're on Verizon, you actually can't switch out of the phone mode because of limitations of CDMA. You can't multi-process. So <coughs> why do we want to lock these individuals out from making these changes? So let's, let's assume, yes, I'm a company. I'm not supporting individuals with disabilities because they don't make a large amount of my customer base. I put in the minimal amount that I need to to sort of look like I care. And thus, we now have to let the community of individuals who have the skills to make these modifications. We have to rely on them to create these accessibility options for other individuals in their community. And, and why, do, why should we lock them out? I, I personally, I don't see a good reason for locking them out. And finally, the notion of hackers, makers, and tinkers. <coughs> so, I firmly believe that creative innovation requires open information and open standards. You can't modify something unless you know what it does and how it does it. And being able to see exactly how a device works is also useful in educational purposes. So if we're trying to learn in the classroom and I give you a smartphone, you'll learn a heck of a lot more if you can see all the source code and install the source code easily on a phone. And this notion of let's poke at it and see what happens. I think we can all relate to when we're debugging or writing software. Many times it's very helpful as we're learning about our code to twiddle a bit here and there and see what happens. And we learn a lot more that way. And that's something that's not possible right now on mobile devices, beyond just the very basic software UI level. So then, when I'm saying open platform, what do I mean by an open platform? Well, I have three criteria. All three of these are not necessarily required, but any number of them, the more you have, the far more open it is. So I start, with no, I start with criteria number one, which is a complete set of source code is required to run all features of the platform. And that source code must be open source. It must meet one of the licenses that has the open source definition, which uh, or the OSI uh, uh, definition for open source. And there's a set of lists, there's a, a list of licenses such as MIT, GPL, BSD, Apache, and a few others that meet the standard. Uh, Mozilla is another one. The second criteria is there must include, the, the software must include a minimal set of build instructions. Because if I can't figure out how to build the software and put it on my device, then I can't modify it. A, a great example would be, uh, think, of, think about Arch, for those who, who might be familiar with Arch Linux or Gentoo Linux, basically, you're building all your software from the ground up. You're putting all your software from just the bootstrap level all the way up to installing the uh, X Windows system, the UI, and all your applications. To be able to do that without the large amount of documentation they provide would be nearly impossible. I, I think most folks, it, without a set of instructions, would not be able to do that. And finally, the third criteria is that the device owner must be able to modify the software on their device without violating any warranties, use agreements, software controls, or hardware controls. So for example, if you have a computer from Dell, HP, Alienware, etc., etc., at home, when you say format the computer and install uh, Linux, so you, you remove Windows, you install Linux, or say on a Macintosh you buy from Apple, you get rid of OS X and you, you install Windows completely or you install Linux completely. 
your warranty is not suddenly null and void from Apple, HP, Dell, if some hardware goes wrong in your device. They won't say, oh, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. They don't care what software is on it. So we have our three criteria for an open platform now. We, we understand, well, we, to be completely open, we need to have some open source software. We need to have software that includes a minimal set of build and install instructions. And we need to have a device where the owner is not penalized for removing the software that's on there and installing new software. So then that raises the question, well, do we have any open platforms right now? And that's where the sad thing comes in. We, we really don't. Um, the last thing that was close to an open platform was a phone by Nokia called the Nokia N900, which is no longer being sold. And it's, by now, for folks who still use it, it is maybe four or five years old. It, it is a, a rather old phone. But that would have allowed you to install Debian Linux, and it allows you to install pretty much anything that is ported to work on that phone. So then I raise the question, well, isn't Android open? I mean, Google says, oh, we're the open, we're the open mobile platform. I mean, we're part of the Open Handset Alliance. I mean, come on, we've got open in the name. We, we must be an open platform, right? Well, not really. Um, so, yes, they, they have the, the uh, Android open source project, but the low-level source code, the drivers, the um, baseband firmware, well, that's all closed source. I can't modify that. I can't even download it for most of the phones out there. I have to take it off a phone I currently have. Google has an extremely hard time getting the proprietary applications and putting them online. So they get them mostly for that. I mean, I can download pretty much all of the Android source. Sure, I can't build a working phone from all the open source uh, files that are out there, I have to still get proprietary binaries. And that's still only for about three or four phones right now. So considering the number of Android phones out there, that's pretty minimal. <coughs> Second definition, well, they, they have to have build and install instructions. And that's actually something Google's really good at. They have an extremely well-documented process for downloading Android, compiling it, installing it. I mean, you need a 16 core machine to be able to do it within an hour, but you can do it. So I give them a yes for criteria number two. And then for criteria number three, we have the device owner must be able to modify the software on their phone without violating warranties, use agreements, etc. And well, that's a resounding no. If I went off and bought a phone from AT&T, whether it be a Nexus S, Nexus One, or any of, say, even the official Google phones, which provide easy unlocking, where you just type in a command on the command line and your phone's unlocked. Well, if I install the official Android open source platform version of Android on the phone and something happens, or a piece of the hardware breaks, that's not even my fault. So my USB port stops working. If I brought that phone back to AT&T, well, if I was lucky, they'd replace it, but most people, if the sales rep saw that I wasn't running the stock version of Android, so I might have been running, say, a third-party distribution called CyanogenMod, I'd be out of luck. I wouldn't be able to get my phone replaced. And this is especially bad for corporations who have to deal with phones in the workplace. And they can't modify, it for security reasons, if they needed to modify things, they can't do it either. So they get a big resounding no on criteria number three. So then, what does the future hold for us? Are we going to see more open platforms? Are we going to see less open platforms? Are we going to have an open mobile space? 
And, and really what we can look to right now is we at least have open platforms with mobile chips. I mean, they're not in a mobile device, but they're the exact same chips and platforms that we see in smartphones. They're just lacking the fancy touch screen. And while you don't have cellular access to begin with, some of them you could plug in a USB cellular dongle, but you'd be sort of carrying around a uh, <clears throat> large piece of equipment with a cellular dongle in it, so it's, it's not really convenient as a cell phone. But they're all ARM-based, all-in-one boards, which is exactly what we have in our cell phones. Just considerably bigger, some of them. And uh, again, they have no cellular access without a dongle. But they're actually um, really cool to develop on, and the reason I'm bringing these up is because I assume, well, since pretty much everyone here, I assume, is informatics or CS, I mean, these would be really cool toys for those of you who like to play around with hardware and like to play around with software and figure out how things work. The first one is the Panda Board ES. And this is one of the first uh, open, one of the first major open specification pieces of hardware. Uh, the group who makes these publishes all the specifications. It's a rather well-featured piece of hardware with, I think now they're offering dual core ARM chips. So this is, again, basically the chips that... Does it equal a GPU and everything? Yes. Oh, like literally ah. it's got the, it's, it's literally everything that would be in uh, smartphones. So you, you, so yeah, you have it, um, and, and actually the ARM platforms right now, uh, for a little bit of detail, the GPU, CPU, audio, it's all built into the same chip. What is the exact size of that? Um, that one I think is maybe about maybe yay big. Um, actually, there's I'll have in, in a little bit I'll show you something even cooler that's coming out on Monday, uh, as far as I know. But this is about two hundred and forty dollars, <coughs> and it and you gain low level abilities such as um, JTAG, which is this very low level debugging. You have L, um, you have uh, various outputs for Ethernet and uh, HDMI, and it, it provides this really great development environment. You, <clears throat> the other one, uh, since the first one I showed you was a uh, standard ARM running a TI chip, this one is also a, a pretty open platform. They supposedly have JPEG support, but I haven't heard much more about it. It's, it's roughly the same price, uh, 250 to $300 is about what TrimSlice is selling it for, but this is based on NVIDIA's hardware. So for those who are NVIDIA fans, um, most of the NVIDIA Tegra stuff is now showing up in a lot of the tablets that run Android. And finally, I, I will end for uh, open platforms that we have right now is something called Raspberry Pi. And this is a really cool piece of equipment. It's being made by Cambridge, and it's a uh, non-for-profit organization that's doing it. And in fact, the device in the end will be um, about the size of a credit card. It's going to be about that big. And it's a full computer. It has a GPU that I believe they said is roughly as fast as what was in the original iPhone, maybe a little bit faster. It has the CPU on there. I think, it, uh, I, I think it's doing audio as well. Um, but you've got a USB port, you can have Ethernet uh, with the upgraded version, and I believe about 256 megabytes of ROM. But what, what is really cool about this, so the last two I showed you were $250, $300. This is going to be, the, two, the higher end version is going to be $35, the lower end is going to be $25. And a lot of this is for education. Uh, a lot of this they, they wanted for educational purposes. And this, I think, is really cool because it's something you could go out and buy. And, you know, it doesn't cost a lot. It's about the cost of maybe 10 lattes or uh, three trips to, you know, like uh, one of the places on Kirkwood. So you cut back for a week and you've got yourself a little computer the size of a credit card. And that's also completely open. The specifications are online. Again, it's a non for profit. So it's a really cool project. So to conclude, well, are we going to have an open mobile space in the future then? I mean, we have these open platforms running mobile chips, 
that might help with things. As people buy these, there's this greater pressure to provide something akin to what we're used to with our desktops and laptops, where we can put on whatever we want. And there is Google's Android open source project. And while I really gave Google and Android a hard time earlier about not being truly open and really sort of halfway open, they're, they're trying to work at it. I mean, they're not, the people in the open source project themselves really want it to be open. And while this was never stated publicly, I think there's perhaps a lot of pushback from other parts of Google, perhaps more business-centric parts of Google that are more concerned with trying to make money from it and keep their partners happy. But if you talk to people in the open source project, they're really trying to get drivers out there, they're trying to get companies to sign license agreements that allow Google to release the files we need, and perhaps eventually we'll have a cell phone that is completely open, that we can modify everything on, that we have open source drivers to, um, the sorts of things we're used to with our desktops and laptops. But in the end, what it's really going to require, I think, is a lot of uh, vocal feedback from the community, both at manufacturers and carriers, because I think they're, they're the real violators of this. It's the Samsung's, Motorola's of the world right now that don't want to give users control. They don't want users to mess with their devices, and companies like AT&T and Verizon don't want users to, be, to do much of anything besides give them money at the end of the month for data services that they can barely use. And they also have this concern of protecting their network, which most people who have an internet connection at home and plug things into their PC, it, it seems they don't worry about it there. So the future for mobile devices, open mobile devices, it's there. But it's too soon to tell which way it's going to go. I'm hoping it goes open. I'm hoping we see something like what we saw with the desktop re revolution. But right now, it could go either way. So I end there, and I ask for uh, if anybody has any questions, comments. Is there, is there, is there any clear case for something? I mean, a certain case for Not that I know of. I have, I mean, I have not heard of a truly strong case. What the carriers will tell you is, well, if we let people mess with the baseband portion of their phone, they might cause problems with network access for themselves. But again, the idea is, well, for those who are, um, I don't want to say intelligent enough, but courageous enough or curious enough to actually modify that part of the phone, they generally know what they're getting into. Security people like to say, well, won't that make hackers have an easier time to get into your phone? Well, no, because they can get in right now, so I, I don't see what the difference will be. And again, the people who are curious enough, courageous enough to modify the phone in that way will know better. So I know of no truly strong case of why we shouldn't have access to our phones, because they're really just like tiny desktops we put in our pocket right now. And from a white hat standpoint, doesn't it make the phone network more secure to have more people poking around at the source and revealing vulnerabilities before they're exploited to the general community? And I know with Mac, when they got a couple white hats cracking at their source, they found two or three vulnerabilities that hadn't been exploited yet and got a patch out before anybody could take a hold of them. Yes, but th this is completely true. The problem is always trying to convince non-security people that that is the case. <laughs> because we, we, I mean, we still have um, large companies out there that think that, oh, if we don't show anybody anything, <clears throat> it's obviously we're better off for it, which is, in the history of any type of security has never been the case. Any other questions? No? Uh, two questions. Uh, yeah. The first one, are these slides going to be available? I can. Okay. I can I can make them and available. And I had some links to like Raspberry Pi, which is really cool. Uh, yes, uh, actually, yeah. The, uh, the links are even, uh, I've got them sitting at the bottom of the slides there. So they're clickable links. So I can pop that up there. Okay. 
Um, and the second one was, um, you said, uh, like, as far as a business standpoint, like, they them being able to alter, uh, like, their own mobile devices could be potentially beneficial for this. Yes. Um, I don't want to sound ne like I'm negating the whole thing, because I really actually uh, am for this all the way, but um, do you think businesses would actually take the time to make the security, uh, or, you know, like, alter it correctly? Oh, uh, well, I... I, I, I... So, if we, we can argue all day about how well businesses do with security, but it is universal that most <coughs> IT groups or security groups in a corporation, when they bring in computers, when they bring in desktops, they're able to install security software that runs at a very low level of the system. I mean, when they run, so, uh, not to get too technically detailed here, but, for example, your Android phone. Your Android phone is far more like a server a business might run than a Windows desktop. So there's things like firewalls, um, intrusion protection systems, intrusion detection systems that are available on our desktops and laptops. And many of these things are Technologies that corporations really depend upon. You can't put them on a phone right now. So you're now having all these phones in corporate environments that don't have these applications running around with sensitive corporate data that aren't protected. Okay. So I do believe that if we, I do believe they would, uh, many security groups would take a keen interest in being able to have low level access to be able to provide some of these more powerful applications that they couldn't do by, say, just installing your regular iPhone application or just installing the regular Android application. Gotcha. Now, again, whether they do it well or not, that's the other debate. Yeah. Let's give uh, Nathan a round. Oh, thank you. Guys.